Look, it's me. I'm at the Clapham Grand. There's incompetent Sandman George in the background. It's the first time I've seen him in a year. Welcome to um, another episode of Rahalastapa. It's not at the Clapham Grand, this one. This one's with Danny Robbins and recorded in my attic. There's a lot about ghosts in here, but I'm recording two gigs at the Clapham Grand and they will go out very soon on this feed. So look out for those. I hope you watch them live. Uh, hopefully we'll be doing more of this in the future and you can see us again. It's just exciting to be out. Look, people are turning up. There's a glitter ball. Look at that, it's amazing. Can you see the glitter? There it is. Uh, anyway, thanks very much for watching. I hope you'll enjoy this podcast. Do become a badger. Go faster.stripe.com slash badgers. Look, I got injured myself. It's a terrible time. All right, sit back, relax, and enjoy Rahalastapa. George calls it that. Rahalastapa. Hello, please welcome a man who's got two broken hoovers. It's Richard Herring. Hello. Yep, two graters. I've got three hoovers. Two of them are broken and the other one doesn't work very well. Yep. Oh, how the other half live. Welcome to Richard Herring's Loft Situated Transmission podcast. Come on, that could be every week. Uh, though I was hanging around in this haunted house that if you're watching, you can see I'm in a haunted house. Ooh, spooky. Uh, and... Uh, all the ghosts who live in there call it ra ha la sta pa. It's on a Ouija board. That's why they use a Ouija board to communicate. That's there. Whew. Might be some more talk about uh, ghosts in this week's show. Um, yeah, we're uh, everything's going all right. Homeschooling still annoying. I'm still doing dry January, even though it's February, uh, and that's going okay. I'm drinking uh, peppermint tea, tea pigs. Mm. Sorry, they don't sponsor me. Don't, I'm not giving them an advert for free. Get in touch, Ian Tea Pigs. Show us the colour of your free tea, and then we'll have a talk. Um, while I remember, uh, I if for people watching this uh, on uh, Twitch, we're doing some live in a theatre. Rahalastapa, Rahalastapas. This Saturday, the 6th of February, they will go out as podcasts down the line if you're listening to this too late. So you will be able to see them. But if you want to watch them live... And you pay a little bit of money to help the Clapham Grand go, which is where we're filming them, and help us make some more podcasts. If you've enjoyed a year of free podcasts uh, and feel like paying seven pounds for one or fourteen pounds for two, we're there at five pm, where um, my guest will be Nish Kumar, and uh, six forty-five pm, where my guest will be Lou Sanders, uh, and we'll be in the same room, socially distanced. Uh, and you can be in the audience online, and I will talk to the audience uh, in this section of the show. So there's a chance for you to actually be. I might ask you some emergency questions. You could be on the actual show if you buy your tickets uh, and and come along and watch them live. Uh, good. So please do uh, go to richhang.com slash gigs to find out about that. Uh, yes, I have. Uh, I, I had a fun thing this week. First of all, I don't think I said this last week, but uh, I've discovered my son thinks that high fives are called hand fives. What a fucking idiot. Who's teaching these kids? It's me at the moment, admittedly. I'm not telling them not. In fact, I've started calling them hand fives as well. <laughs> so that just somewhere down the line, he's going to look like an idiot in front of some people who's trying to look cool in front of hand five. He's only three. 28 years old he is. Oh, no, I ruined it. Uh, and... Uh, we, we had we bought foolishly bought a Dyson two Dyson uh, vacuum cleaners. We've got we've got an older one and a newer one. Uh, before I really knew the whole Brexit implications about that, but they break quite easily and they're very expensive to repair and the parts are very expensive. But I found a man in the Hatfield uh, and I, you can drive to his house and he's an old man <laughs> and you hand over your Dysons and your other uh, vacuum cleaners and he will mend them for you. Uh, and, uh, yeah, he was complaining about the cost of Dyson stuff. He doesn't use the Dyson things. The, the switch broke on it, so uh, he, he couldn't get that. And he rang me up and said it's going to be £30 to get a new switch. from. You can't get them from Dyson. And he was worried. He thought that would be too high a price for me to pay. But I said, no, let's go for it, mate. But it was like having a drug dealer, but I was giving him uh, Hoovers, and he was then going to repair the Hoovers. But it was quite fun to drive to the outskirts of Hatfield, make an exchange. Made me feel, made me feel alive. 
made me feel good. So um, that's it. Uh, if you uh, like the uh, watching stuff on Twitch, uh, I play snooker on Monday nights, and I also do the puppet show usually on Thursday nights. Twitch.tv slash RK Herring, if you haven't caught on yet. If you're with Amazon Prime, don't forget that you can give us free money every month. And if you've done it already, you just have to remember to go back and subscribe. Uh, it, we take it from Ian Amazon. I know it's a new Ian Amazon now. He's regenerated, but he's still called Ian Amazon. They've had, they hand it hands down from father to son. Um, so t- please try and take his money. We got some quite good money from you in the first place, but now it's dwindled a bit. So let's steal some of Ian Amazon's money and put it to good use of making stupid puppet shows. Did somebody say stupid? Look at this fucking thing. Ah! Um, okay. Stunky, why are you wearing that T-shirt? Okay, we're going to get on with it. My guest doesn't know what's going on. Uh, my guest is probably best known for playing Brian O'Green on the seminal BBC Radio 2. It's nearly said BBC 2. Radio 2 sketch show that everyone quotes and talks about all the time because it's the greatest sketch show of all time. That was then, this is now. Twitatin, twitatin. It's Danny Robbins, ladies and gentlemen. Here he is. Hello. Hello, hello. How are you doing? I'm good. You haven't changed at all <laughs> since I last, I last saw you, which is probably 15 years ago. Have I seen you recently? I, I don't you know. You look exactly the same. Yeah, I have that illusion we've seen each other recently through social media. But um, I, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to maintain an ageless state here. Um, You're doing very well. I, I'm, I'm basically, I'm, I'm like uh, Blanche in Streetcar Named Desire. I'm sitting in a very dark room, as you see me, so you can't see the reality. I'm in my shed in the garden with very few lights on. It's very nice. Well, you've kept your hair, and that's the important thing, Danny. As long as you can keep that hair, it'll start to grey. Maybe it has started to grey. Maybe you're, cu- you're colouring it in a bit. I, I, can you see my, my headphones have actually sort of disappeared into my hair? They've sort of morphed <laughs> yeah. into one mighty black helmet. Uh, what do you remember about uh, that was then? This is now. That was a. Uh, that was. Uh, I can't remember who wrote that and who was the presenter of it. But it was a great. It was a. Great, it was happy days. Uh, I, I remember that very of, it, it was so. It was a weird. It was a weird little time in my life. I think that we we it, the weird. Uh, it was uh, for those of you who don't know. It was a, a sketch show that uh, I f- hosted and uh, fronted, and uh, and then Danny uh, Robbins and Dan Tetzel. And Emma Kennedy were in it, and Christian Riley. It was sort of as it occurs to me, uh, and then with an extra bloke in it, <laughs> yeah. then wasn't it as it occurs to me. You just how did you feel when? <laughs> how did you feel when um, you saw it as it occurs to me it was coming out? Well, and you weren't in it. Very left out, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> Hurt, chilted. Um, you, you were asking earlier about why we hadn't seen each other for fifteen years, yeah. but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I don't think it was anything personal. No, I don't think there was anything was personal. But you, I think it was just that there was too. We had, I felt with that was then. This is now there was too many people in it for the uh, certainly for the time <laughs> slot of radio two because we were all kind of trying to yeah. write stuff and put stuff into it. We? Well, that's that's very flattering. But um, I, uh, I, I, no, I I I realized though that the, the voice I do for Brian O'Green. Yeah. Or did for Brian O'Green is essentially the voice I do for my character Ian in the Cold Swedish Winter on Radio Four. So okay. in a way, it's it's an homage to uh, to those days together. It's the same well, kind of, na- of nasally time, voice because it was a conspiracy. He was a conspiracy theory nut who came up with crazy conspiracy theories that that kind of spiraled out of control. And now that's well, it. Wouldn't even be a joke now if you put it on. <laughs> People would go, "Yeah, that's a good one." Good idea. Though I think he did link everything back to Star Trek, and I think <laughs> people did. may not get those references now. <laughs> you never know. I was going to give you some trivia about Brian O'Green because this was. Oh, go on. Uh, he was he was based on Danny Bryan and um, uh, Dave Green, who we were at university with, who went on to do um, uh, sort of it, were the first people on the internet. They did Need to Know and all sorts of stuff, and they're still very big cogs in the kind of e- internet business. I think. Uh, but uh, the first time the character appeared, I think, was in Time Gentleman Please, where he's played by Ben Moore. And uh, they were in a show called Reve- uh, Day of the Triv Heads. And they were on a trivia team. It was Ben Moore, Colin Baker from Doctor Who, I think. And uh, it was one of the Doctor Whos anyway. And Luke Youngblood was, I thought he was Danny O'Brien, uh, Brian O'Gree, but he wasn't. He was someone else. But he went on to play Magnitude in Community. Oh, wow. So you are linked <laughs> to Magnitude in Community. By two degrees of separation. So, are you saying that Brian O'Green was like Lucy Robinson in Neighbours, and that he kind of <laughs> morphed into different there people? Was, there were lots. There might have even been one before, because I'm sure it was a name me and Stu used quite a lot. I was, I was the brunette Brian, was I? <laughs> you, 
<laughs> yeah, I think you're the tenant. You're the David Tennant, <laughs> Brian O'Green. We right. went. Let's get. Let's get a handsome guy to be Brian O'Green. <laughs> see how that works out. <laughs> now, now back to the big nerds. That's pretty cool. I've I've worked with Magnet. He was also in Harry. He was one of the only black characters in Harry Potter and who spoke. I think he had about two lines. You, Luke Youngblood, he's doing pretty well. Hope you're all right, Luke, if you're watching. Um, anyway, let's crack on. Look, uh, the the reason uh, the 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 impetus to have you on, which I should have done before, because actually you've done so much stuff. I'm not just going to talk about ghosts, but we're mainly going to talk about ghosts uh, because uh, you have got a podcast out right now, which I highly recommend to anyone interested in, uh, in either who are skeptical of ghosts as I am, or who are kind of into ghosts, which I also am. Um, it's called the Path- the Battersea Poltergeist. Which I googled and looked up, and it's such. And you say you're in the thing going, "Oh, it's such a famous case." And I know what you're like. I think you just made the whole thing. I think you've made it up. You put a few little bit, bits online, like a picture or two, <laughs> and someone's written a book about it on the Kindle, which could be you. Is it a real? Is it a real story, or have you made it up? It really is. I mean, I think the thing <laughs> is that it was it was huge in 1956, 65 yeah. years ago. This is just insanely massive. So. I mean, you know, most people probably have heard of the Enfield poltergeist. Uh, you know, it was in the 70s and it's, you know, The Conjuring 2 was made about it, even though they sort of injected a homicidal nun as a baddie into that. But um, but basically, I mean, this was bigger than Enfield back in 56. It was like on the front pages of all the newspapers. Uh, Shirley, the teenager at the heart of it, was on primetime BBC television with Cliff Mitchellmore, who was this guy who was basically the Hugh Edwards of his day. He went on to front uh, like the moon landings and the Kennedy assassination. He was kind of big news guy. And he was getting her to try and channel her poltergeist at seven o'clock on BBC television. And, and you know, there were questions in the Houses of Parliament, like the Home Secretary was actually talking about this poltergeist. So it was enormous. And she had, you know, a, a journalist camped outside the house and the family was under siege from the press. But then it just kind of got forgotten about, really. And I think partly that was because the family wanted to forget about it. And partly it's because it was 56 and it was long before things were kind of routinely filmed. And, you know, Enfield, there is much more documentary evidence on that. But um, so it's like this undiscovered gem of a poltergeist case. And, and I think what I've realized doing this is that people love a ghost story. People even more love a poltergeist story because you get that tangibility of things flying around the room. And then to find a poltergeist story that people don't know, it's like, I mean, it's been brilliant to see that the, po- the paranormal community, I was going to say the poltergeist community, they're, they're, <laughs> very, anim- excited they're very animated about it, yeah. Um, but uh, the, the paranormal community are just loving this. They're kind of creaming their pants over the fact that they've got this new case to look at. And I'm being bombarded by emails at the moment of people wanting to know like the specifics of where exactly the house was and, you know, all these details about the case. And it, it's, it's brilliant. Because it's quite rare. I mean, especially when something's been headline news, it's quite rare that there isn't like a Wikipedia page or anything about it. I don't know, I don't know if it even, probably now it's, might have one but it, it there was when i looked up because i thought well i want to find you know that's it's very good for your podcast because it's very hard to find out any information about what actually happened so you have this we're about halfway through the series i guess you're doing is it a series of six yeah a series of eight oh, actually eight, yeah, eight yeah, yeah, yeah so yeah. we're coming up to halfway through uh and it's you know there's there's a lot of questions still to be answered that i don't i don't particularly want you to answer now as i'm sure you neither do you but um and and the real uh surprise is that shirley's still with us I know. Or at least was when you recorded. Well, <laughs> she, I mean, we are pushing her hard, but she is she is brilliant. I mean, um, I, this morning I got an interview request from Australian Breakfast Television for Shirley. Shirley's fast becoming an international celeb. Uh, she was on this morning with uh, Philip and Holly the other day, but she's um, I mean, sh- she's brilliant because she is an incredible storyteller, an incredible witness, and and she remembers these events like they were yesterday. She's she's eighty, and this was when she was fifteen. Uh, and uh, it's just incredible, the clarity of her memories. And the thing, though, that really drew me into this and really made me want to take on this, and actually the point where I felt, yes, this could be eight parts, was just this little moment where she's talking to me and she says, I'm worried it could bring him back. And it sends this little shiver down your spine. And it's something that I've noticed a few listeners picking up on and spotting. But it's that moment where you, you are totally convinced that she believes this 100%. Yeah. And so then, like, whatever comes from that point, whatever you believe, if you believe it's a haunting or, or, you know, that it's it's all in the minds of the people, I just think that that takes you to such interesting territory because this person is totally convinced that all of this incredibly mad stuff happened. They're still convinced 65 years later. 
So it's, it's in, immensely powerful. What, whatever happened then, the, the strange noises, the objects flying, she is totally convinced of it. Yeah, she could be lying, though, Danny. That's the thing. She could be. Do you think that, that would involve me being a terrible judge of character? It would. <laughs> but I think like, the thing with people who lie about stuff is they're good. <laughs> the ones but who then, get away with it again, are, I mean, are good at it. <laughs> But that, 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 that it makes it even more interesting. I sort of feel whichever way you come to this, you know, yeah. in, even if you're convinced she's lying uh, her pants off, then it, it's it's equally interesting to follow that, you know. Well, I would just say from the from the most recent episode, I know you've done a little. Uh, I've been listening to all of your stuff down in the last week, and uh, I've listened to all of this series. Um, I know you did a little extra catch up with viewers' idea or listeners' ideas and and uh, other bits of information. But in in episode three, which is the one that's just gone out. The the grandmother goes out of the room because she's scared just before the poltergeist turns up. Do you not f- find that a bit suspicious? She goes, oh, no, I'm not having this with all these. It's against God and nature. I'm going out. <laughs> <laughs> Do you reckon um, that might she, she might have been in on it a little well, bit? I mean, that's what I think. I think there might be a little bit of collusion going on there. I, I think that's what I, I'm enjoying. And hopefully people are enjoying that. You've got this <laughs> cast of characters and it, it is like it's a detective story. The, 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 the idea was always to do like a true crime podcast about a ghost story. And, and, and you've got, you know, you've got the adopted brother, the, the, the mum who's, who's kind of very frustrated and is kind of housebound due to her illness and, and you know, hasn't really left the house. The, the grandmother who's also housebound and kind of, you know, has these very strong religious beliefs and beliefs in the supernatural and, you know, and, and just these all these interesting characters. And you are kind of wondering, like, you know, has one of these people had something to do with the haunting, you know? So... <laughs> So, yeah. Anyone is, you know, it is fascinating. I've always, I know you've always been fascinated with ghosts, uh, and I've always been fascinated with the supernatural stuff. And I think, especially when I was younger and more kind of susceptible to it, though I still, you know, I still, you know, the, the beauty of this and of the uh, the series you did called Haunted, which I think we'll talk a little bit about as well. And well, let's let's stick with this one for the moment. Is that you know, it's very hard to be entirely skeptical about it because there are enough weird things happening that you you know. As I say, you just throw it on. In a way, that when you get the the cynics and the the, the scientists on, their kind of explanation explanations are almost as far fetched as it being a ghost. So, you're, as as much as I'm going, oh come on, this is bullshit. When they come on and go, this is bullshit because of this. You go, oh that's fucking bullshit. You <laughs> expert. That's that would it can't be that it can't be that all these things have happened at once and create this I, thing. Uh, uh, but so I think that's what's interesting is because even in your own mind you're sort of being pulled in in two different directions. Totally, and I think one of the things when you talk to skeptics and you know psychologists who try and explain these things is that one of the big problems that they face is that their explanations are very boring and and <laughs> and, and, and and complicated. You know, and yeah. actually the the beauty of ghosts is that it, I mean it's beautifully simple, and and I think that's why. Skeptics sort of have such an uphill battle trying to convince people because their their explanation takes a lot of explaining. It's complicated, it involves scientific terms, and it's just not as satisfying or exciting or as newsworthy. No, but I mean, I, well, I, you sort of wanted. I really, you know, I think you want it to be true, don't you? you? You want all these things to be real, and I think you're, you know, fairly level headed about it. But you kind of you would love it if it if it was true. I, I love to believe in the magic of it. And I, I love the yeah. story of it, and I've never understood the kind of need to kind of pour loads of cold water on it. I, I, I think it's brilliant when people are genuinely scared about a ghost to be offered them, to be able to offer them scientific explanations and to say it's to do with, you know, sleep paralysis or, you know, that state between sleeping and waking hypnagogic states. But um, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, when you've got a great ghost story, you want to run with it and enjoy it. And, yeah. and very early on when we we're making Haunted, I sort of said to myself, you know, I want this show to be equally enjoyed by believers and skeptics. And I want to sort of yeah. have a foot in both camps. And and I don't want to be the guy who's sort of, you know, debunking at the end of it. And and because frankly, I mean, who's going to want to tell you their ghost story? If all you do at the end of it, you go like, nah, it wasn't real. <laughs> Sorry, next, you know. And and so, I think, you know, I, I yeah. feel like at the end of Battersea Poltergeist, you know, we'll have loads of theories about it. And there'll be very strong theories on both the skeptic side and the believer side. We've got two experts with very conflicting viewpoints on it uh, Kieran O'Keefe and Evelyn Hollow but at the end of it I mean I would feel devastated if, if Shirley felt like we'd sort of taken for her for a ride at the end of the thing and just sort of you know um said oh it, none of it was real at the end and, and I think yeah. the thing about her story is that it is so genuinely puzzling there are so many bizarre elements to it that each time you think you've got some light on the case suddenly you plunge down a real dark alley and it's, it's like a labyrinth you're constantly turning these corners you think you've got it cracked and then oh no there's something truly truly weird's happened and does the without going into absolute specifics, does the key that starts it all off, does that come back into at any point? Do we find out what that key 
was or is, or is it is it just? I mean, no. The a key, the, the, key the key definitely comes back in, and the key is is significant. I mean, I think that the thing that people will have to decide is how it's significant, and in what way is it significant? You know, is, is it the haunted object, or is it you know the object that kind of kicks off some in, intensely interesting kind of psychological drama in the family? Um, you know, I, I think that that's uh, you know I, what I'm loving is that you've got two rival sides. I mean, it basically is as binary and diverse as Brexit. This, I, yes. I mean, it is incredible the, the the anger that can be generated from some people. Like, I, I've got a mate who's just so skeptic. He's like, "Why would you want to do this? Why 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 would you be interested? It it doesn't exist." And furious, you know. And and on the other end of it, I've got really ardent believers who are kind of sending me their stories and offering me you know, kind of, you know, explanations that are entirely paranormal. And, you know, and, and I, I, I sort of relish both of those things. You know, I love Good. it. You know, I agree. You should. It is brilliant, though. And I think the, and the, the series Haunted as well, which came before this from 2017, 2018, is also just is beautifully and brilliant research. But I'll let, we'll make, we may talk about that in a sec, as I said. Um, I'm kind of interested in, like, A, I'm interested in why we, as humans, we kind of want to be scared, right? I mean, there's my son, who's three, uh, is very easily scared of stuff and they're very obsessed with ghosts uh but he loves it as well so like he's terrified but loves being terrified and i think that's that sticks that stays with us right so he's all, almost egging it on he thinks he's you know he we live as i was telling you before we live in a house from 1702 he has a bedroom that has a door that used to go into our room so that used to have doors all the way around in the in you know in so each room led to each room but now it's but there's this blocked mm-hmm. up door that yeah, he's yeah. obsessed with. Oh, God, and okay. he's, he's, he's talked about people coming through and, oh, it being a, and it being a prison behind them and stuff like oh, God. that. We, we had a case uh, like that in Haunted where there was yeah, two, yeah. two doors into a bedroom. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there, yes, you did. So there's a few things that were like, but also I've had a. So we've had when the, when the, when he was young, when he was a baby, so we had two kids, he was a baby and we just moved in and it was, we were very tired, obviously, and everything was uh, up in the air and lots of stress. But me and my wife together heard ba- a baby crying and then went into both of our children's rooms and both of our children were asleep. No, uh, no, and so uh, This is interesting. Did, then, did you have a baby monitor on? Um, yes. So I think like we could, but also we sometimes heard it with not on the baby monitor. Sometimes okay. we'd hear the crying coming from somewhere else. And the someone tweeted me from my village and said the people who live next door to you, which used to be the same house when they had a baby, they said the same thing happened in the house that they, that they, that they had to I've got a shiver down my spine there. Um, so that's pr- quite a good one. But there, there is this intriguing thing, though, about phantom noises and baby monitors and about right. baby monitors picking up baby monitors in other people's houses and, and yes. hearing noise. And, um, and, and apparently, like, um, when baby monitors were first invented, they were invented because of this thing, the, um, the oh, God, what was he called? Charles Lindbergh. He was a, a pilot who'd flown... Uh, across the Atlantic, I think, and you know, in those days, this was back in the '30s, and it was like, you know, going to the moon—an incredible achievement. And uh, he became very rich. And then um, one day, some pe- some people kidnapped his his child from an upstairs yeah. room, and uh, and the, uh, they took them off. And eventually, very sadly, the baby died. And and it was a horrendous, awful case. But after that, the baby monitor was invented because people were so nervous about this happening to their child. Right, but it had this kind of offshoot kind of thing of like people hearing these phantom noises from other people's baby monitors. So actually, whereas it was meant to reassure people, it engendered more anxiety that people became terrified that their baby they're was crying. spooky as well because they're spooky because a like everything looks spooky on a baby monitor. So if your kid sits up and has their eyes open, you've got that kind of weird bright eye thing. But also, there's always lots of weird phantom movements on them as well so if you if you're watching it you kind of think is that what's that moving across the room so there's things that look like ghosts and yeah you hear sometimes you feel you've heard something sometimes you've obviously tuned into someone else's or someone's hacked there's those instances where people have hacked oh, yeah into, some really sinister hacked, things yeah yeah <laughs> started um, talking to the kids but uh, so yeah so we've had we've had that in this house uh and you know and i and i it is stopped the minute we stopped being tired and it stopped the minute we didn't have a baby that no that we don't get babies crying I think we might have heard it a bit the other day again, but it was the the weird thing was that we both we both heard it at the same time. But don't you think that uh, kids are creepy? Full stop. I think that that that, <laughs> that period of being a, a parent in those early days just feels to me like t- totally full and redolent with quite creepy moments where yeah. a child says something that seems like to come from a very old soul. You know, sort of that yeah. kind of that kind of wisdom and. and um, and you know, just like like you say, lots of moments where they just shoot bolt upright in the night and say something in their sleep, and you know, or, or, or ectoplasmic kind of projectile vomit. 
<laughs> they are scary. I'm terrified. My daughter told me that uh, a few months ago, she said, you are the, you're you're going to be the next person who dies in our family. Oh, God. But I think yeah. she just meant because I'm the oldest. <laughs> <laughs> but it very much felt like a sort of gypsy curse. Yeah, or, so I'm now or, or, living every moment. Or a threat. <laughs> <laughs> I think that she might, she might kill me. Um, and then the other thing that happened, which, again, is this... I mean, that in the haunted show, I recognised like a lot of the a lot of the stuff came when people were thought they were asleep or had just woken up, and you get that all the things that are slightly spooky that happened to me, uh, apart from the baby scream, which we were always tired, um, have been like waking up. The other day, I uh, I my wife shouted no in her sleep, and which she does quite a lot, and I was sure I was awake. And my son walked into the room, which is weird because he's got a gate on his room, so he can't get out. He walked into the room, then stood just in a corner, looking into the corner, and it was a hundred percent solid. My son, absolutely him. He just, but and I was going, Ernie, Ernie, and he just looked away. He was looking in a corner, oh, no. and I reached out to get him, and he, then he disappeared. And oh my so god! It was, but it was like a, it yeah, felt yeah. like a hundred percent real, which is what all these people yeah, say. Yeah. It obviously wasn't. It was obviously a dream, but I felt like. You know, I felt yeah, like yeah. I was doing. I felt like I don't know if I even reached out. I don't know whether how how far it went. But that you know, people. If he had then died two days later, we'd have gone. Oh my goodness, that was that was a premonition of his death. So occasionally that must happen. And then there's one. I think is it. I think it was in one of your shows where someone said they'd seen. Or maybe it's maybe it's someone of line actually. I've been talking about ghosts a lot. Um, that someone said that they'd seen their dad, the ghost of their dad, five days before their dad died. There's one. There's yeah. one on yours where where the kitchen gets. Uh, pulled apart but at the same time as the mother dies doesn't it forget this yeah one. i think so yeah, yeah 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 um no no totally i mean but have you had um sleep paralysis ever yeah yeah so i've spent, yeah. I've, I've experienced like a hag sitting on me strangling yeah. me uh i've experienced uh i've had uh lucid dreaming so that guy there's a great one about south africa and a guy who's not that interested in apartheid who's a student who keeps on coming downstairs and seeing the clock has at different times back and forth and then walks back upstairs. <laughs> I don't want to ruin it, but he's greeted by a life-size uh, gollywog uh, that's reaching out to get him. That, that, uh, that's the, the, I think that's the episode people talk about most. And the intriguing thing about that is that when you're looking at it, you can see, I mean, as an outsider, you feel it seems clear to us that he's in a dream, he's in a nightmare. Yeah, but yeah. the fear he felt was so real that even though he is, I mean, he's an entirely rational guy and he, he sort of, doesn't believe in ghosts, but he cannot get over that level of fear. And so he can't ever convince himself it was a dream. Yeah. And, and you see the a... power of fear at that moment. <laughs> well, but also it's such a brilliant, I mean, you handle it so, I mean, you're brilliant at this job. You're absolutely brilliant because you you make it spooky, but you, you know, you, you make and you, you present it in such a great way. Uh, and, but you also get to the nub of it. And, you know, you're talking about how it's a metaphor for what's going on. <laughs> in south africa at the time but it absolutely is it absolutely i mean you discuss it with someone but it absolutely is a man you know whose internal guilt is is about this the whole situation that he's living in and not caring about or not particularly caring about and then it's sort of brought to life in his imagination but you know i've had dreams like that that seem that real and where you're i've had lucid dreams where you're able to do things in the dreams and then those have turned into non-lucid dreams and i've had a dream where i've woken up seven or eight times convinced i'm awake and then not be, and then woken up again you know and and it's and it seemed absolutely real each time to the extent that i'm not sure that i'm not still in that dream mm. and i'm about to i might just wake up now it was 20 years ago uh, but <laughs> this would be a very long portion of the dream Ex- if it wasn't. extreme but, you know, sleep paralysis but a lot yeah. of those a lot, a lot of them are, are come from a lot of people have just woken up or or just gone to bed when they see these things uh, i guess what's fascinating about the poltergeist cases is there's usually a teenage, usually a teenage girl, isn't it? Is, there, is, there, is it ever a teenage boy? Well, it is sometimes, but it takes <laughs> us into very interesting territory. And that's one of the things that we've covered in the series, really, this idea of why do we have this thing as a society of obsessing about this kind of haunted teenage girl? And, and you know, are, are, you know, is there genuinely something in that? I mean, are poltergeists literally attracted to teenagers? Or are we somehow kind of manufacturing this, you know? And, I mean, certainly when you look at the newspaper coverage of the time, it's really salacious and really quite creepy. You've got this idea yeah. of like, uh, you know, vivacious teenager and her spooky lover. And, um, and you know, we, we, we found, we turned up newspaper articles from like local newspapers in America. It spread everywhere, but they were constantly going on about like pert bobby soxer and vivacious teenager. And it was incredibly sexualized and, and felt really inappropriate now. And, and so you have this situation where you, you've not only got Shirley 
kind of, you know, traumatized by the idea of the poltergeist, but also traumatized by the press coverage of it. And she gets stuck between these two things, what's happening to her, but also how it's portrayed. Yeah. But do you, it, the other explanation is that they that it's the the girls are are attempting to get you know some kind of uh, either recognition or attention. Oh. Uh, there's that there's that case that I got. The, there's the case of the was it a mongoose or something oh, in the yes, war? The yes, talking yes. mongoose in the war. That's another teenage girl yeah. talk. And it, that she... Je- Jeff the talking mongoose. It's Jeff, an amazing yeah. story. Yeah, in a in a very isolated house on the Isle of Man, I think it is. And, and um, they, they had streams of journalists coming to see this talking mongoose. And Harry Price, the, the greatest ghost hunter of like, the 30s and 40s, coming to investigate. And yeah, I mean, it was a, a, allegedly a, a mongoose that was chatting about theology and could speak various languages. And, and, and they believed, ultimately, I think that it was probably an act of ventriloquism by this teenage girl. But, yeah. but I mean, I, I think, you know, the Enfield uh, case is, is one of the most famous examples of teenage girls being sort of scrutinized to see whether it's real or whether they are are hoaxing. And I think w- what all of those cases have in common that ours doesn't is that the girls were unhappy and the family was uh, unhappy. And and there's, there's a quote from a, a great book, Colin Wilson's book, Poltergeist, which is kind of like, you know, the sort of industry Bible. And, uh, and he talks about a poltergeist never happens to a happy family. But actually in Battersea, it's very, <laughs> very hard to see how this family is unhappy. They seem to be a kind of solid unit, a kind of happy family. So that's where you kind of have to probe to see, are there any unhappinesses? Because on paper, it does seem very different to the other cases where you see like kind of obviously troubled people. And I mean, you look at like Janet now from the Enfield Haunting, who I think is probably in her late 40s or or 50s. And, and I mean, you know, I don't want to pass judgment, but when you see and the few interviews that she's done, she looks like someone who's quite unhappy and has had quite a hard life. I mean, she looks right. sort of like it's taken its toll on her. Whereas Shirley doesn't. I mean, Shirley is it's a kind of amazing, sprightly, kind of bouncy eighty-year-old. Yeah, that's good. I mean, there's a chance, I suppose, that you could be doing stuff without consciously doing it, right? Without knowing you're doing. So you could be, you could be so into it yourself, you don't know that it's you that's doing. Yeah, I mean, and there's the, the whole area of dissociative behaviour where you have like kind of, of you know what used to be called split personalities. You know, um, the, the, the idea of compartmentalised things where somebody is doing something and has absolutely no idea that they're doing it you know so yeah i mean w- once you start delving into possible scientific explanations for poltergeist stuff it, it's it, that that's properly fascinating psychologically as well but I, I think what's what's quite hard to get around with our case is this uh thing of the multiple witnesses you've got lots of people and not just the family you've got you know uh the, the ghost hunter harold chibbett who's there you've got journalists witnessing stuff i mean we've got a journalist spending the night in Shirley's bed and and leaving the next day convinced she's witnessed a poltergeist. You know? So you have lots of moments where you have an outside witness come in, which makes the whole thing more complicated. But, you know, why is it not happening all the time, Danny? Why is it only happening? Well, this, this is a good question. Yeah, why aren't yeah. all the ghosts coming back? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely coming. If I can come back, I'm going to come back and I'm going to come to you, first of all. If I can come back, I'm going to push things. <laughs> if I'm, I just push things around. I'll do whatever I can do to make it clear it's me. I, I have heard. I think I'll go first. I've heard skeptics come up with some great questions, like why? You know, if if ghosts literally just were people coming back from dying, why aren't hospitals just rammed with ghosts? You know, because <laughs> yeah. most people don't die at home these days, and and like and also why aren't ghosts naked? Because clothes don't die. You know, so these kind of questions that, that skeptics will chuck at you, but to spoil your fun. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and from this the, this the the haunted series. I mean, there's well, again, there's like ten episodes, eight, ten episodes. Yeah, of that ten, ten episodes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's an awful lot of work that's gone in there because it's research. They're very well. They're, it's they're all beautifully produced. These podcasts and they're, but it feels like a lot of research has gone in. Did it take you a long time to? Were you driven behind that, or did you have a team of people helping you put well, all that together? I mean, I mean we, we did have a team, but it was a complete labour of love, certainly. And you know, I mean, Haunted was one of those things that you do without really being paid properly at all because yeah. you're in love with the subject and, and you put it out there. And thankfully, a lot of people have enjoyed it. And and I know it's brought a lot of people to the Battersea Poltergeist. I mean, Battersea Poltergeist is being done on a proper BBC budget. So, you know, the kind of ambition of it is achievable. And we've been able to have, you know, like Toby Jones as the ghost yeah. hunter and Daphne Keane from his Dark Materials as, as Shirley and the brilliant Alice Lowe and, and um, Bern Gorman and Calvin Denver, all these kind of great people. So th- that that's amazing that we've done this on, on a sort of, a proper budget and, and have been able to do it properly. Yeah. Like Haunted was just crazy. Like I remember going to like Aberdeen, uh, Aberdeen to do one thing, like flying up and back in a day and, you know, just like, you know, bonkers. Yeah. 
<clears throat> well, out of all those, what out of all those stories, do you have a uh, a favourite one or one that you th- do? Do you do you have ones that you suspect? All oh, right, okay, I don't think the the one in the uh, Shepter Mallet prison, for example, felt the guy who got the cigarette burn felt very much like a guy who wanted to get in the newspapers and was prepared yeah. to put a, a cigarette on his own hand to do that. It- uh, whereas the other ones seemed. Uh, harder to explain yeah yeah it's interesting i mean i think there was a point making haunted where i felt like because we were talking to skeptics each week about stuff and they were kind of loading me up with all these different scientific explanations i, I did find like i went for a, a time of people would tell me their ghost stories and i'd go ah that's probably a sleep thing and you, and you kind of feel like you have a lot of explanations but then when we came to the end of the series we made this one uh that was uh in an old hospital that doesn't exist anymore in um london and um and it was a nurse who'd had these experiences uh, that were poltergeist experiences. And, and it had involved things being thrown around a seemingly empty room and seeing a ball of light flying, uh, fl- floating across very slowly in front of her. And, um, and it was all connected to this patient that she'd lost, who she felt uh, had suffered too much, that he'd, he'd, his, his life had been prolonged too much and he should have been allowed to die peacefully sooner. And she felt guilt about that. But her experiences were witnessed by about four nurses. So these four nurses saw the ball of light and witnessed the, the things being thrown around the room and opened the door and went into a room and, and were confronted by this sort of thing that chilled them all to the bone, this kind of mixture of atmosphere and f- freezingness and, and just a feeling and, you know, that feeling that people can't put their finger on. But the fact that all these people had experienced it together was that was the most head scratcher of all the cases. I think that's the one yeah. where I walked away from it going, I don't think we offered a, a, an adequate skeptic explanation. I, th- I feel like with all most of the others, we are, you know, I, I still leave the door totally open and it absolutely could have been paranormal, but I felt like we offered a potentially convincing skeptic explanation for the others, but that, that was the one that was hardest to pin down. Sure. And I, I guess what's interesting about it as well, because it's, it's more, I think there's more to it. It's just, it's ri- it's a fascinating subject. And I think it's sort of endlessly fascinating. And it's a great, thing to have landed on i think but but i think in in that you know in the one the shepter mallet one to find out about the um gis being uh sentenced to death you know that's a social history that that people wouldn't be aware of you know that there was that that american gis were coming over committing crimes during the war and and then being sort of executed uh very quickly in chapter mallet you know it's and, and cr- crucially that it was black gis and, and yeah. they, they were being disproportionately killed a, a lot of uh crimes you know i mean i think there were black gis being blamed for crimes committed by white gis and you know right. a bit being hanged in their place and um so that, that was interesting and you know but actually you know the, the, the sort of history of hauntings does plunge you into interesting social territory and there's a guy called roger clark you might know who wrote a natural history of ghosts which is a a brilliant book that I'd highly recommend to anyone to read as a kind of entry level to the the kind of history of of why we believe in ghosts. But you know, he talks about us kind of getting the ghosts we deserve. We get ghosts for certain times, and so like the 18th century is full of ghosts obsessed with wills and codicils and you know kind of cracking where was that will buried, you know. And then you know obviously you have the ghosts of the war dead after the First World War and the Second World War, and you have that people being obsessed with trying to contact the sons and husbands and fathers they've lost you know sure. and, and now i sort of feel like we are plunged into a time of great uncertainty again you know we've had the whole kind of trump era the, the brexit era and we're living in kind of very conflicted turbulent times and i feel like you are seeing this kind of upsurge in paranormal interest there's a boom in horror movies you know and i think it's a time when people are very interested in ghosts because it taps into that uncertainty i think yeah it's it's absolutely fascinating we'll talk about some other stuff but um, yeah, do check out both uh, Haunted and uh, Battersea Poltergeist. But can I just tell you though that my wife, yes. my wife is so scared she's never listened to Haunted or Battersea Poltergeist, <laughs> and even though I've tried to force her to listen to them, she went. Even though she features in in Battersea Poltergeist, but, um, but she she's such a scaredy cat that the, the other night I was here in my shed working away and I had the blinds down so the, the no light was shining out. And she was convinced, it's quite new blind, so she, it was new to her, and she was convinced that there was nobody in the shed and I wasn't in the house. And she became convinced that I'd been killed in the garden. And <laughs> rather than going to check, uh, looking for my murdered body, she locked the door of the house to protect her and the children. And so then, and then called me and, and she was like, oh, are you alive? And I was like, yeah, I'm alive, I'm in the shed. And, <laughs> but she locked me out of the house in case <laughs> I, was I was planning lying, my new life. Lying dead in the garden. So that, that's, that's what a scaredy cat she is. Yeah, but I'm, I, you know, I walk the dog at night, and I, I, you know, there's a part where I, there's a point where I shined a torch and thought I saw like a woman and 
now in my memory, it's like a woman and her kids and stuff. It probably was just a woman. And then I turned around a bit and then there was, she'd gone. And, that, and then the other day there was a gate there that was just open that's never usually open that was kind of creaking back and forth. And so you, the minute you sort of spook yourself with yeah. something, it's really hard not to then observe a hundred other things at that same place. So I completely understand why people get that association and then you, you're already scared. And it must go back to, you know, we, I, it's understanding the beginning of religion as well as the beginning of ghosts. If we were living on the savannah and it was pitch black at night time, and if you would, if you left the fire, you'd be eaten by a you know some terrible yeah. creature that would rip you apart that you couldn't see. You would, you would, you know, start in you. You would start creating religions to stop you a to stop you doing it, but b to explain it. And you'd also be, you know, you'd be wary of things that had led to people dying or or whatever. So it's all really understandable how it yeah. how the human mind can. Well, could have created it. We, we talk about the monkey brain and the lizard brain. You know, the lizard brain is meant to be the oldest part of the brain, the kind of the, 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 that bit from back in those days, the fight or flight mechanism, and uh, that protects us from predators like the, around the campfire, like you say. And that, that is incredibly powerful. That always wins out. And you, 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 all, all these things, so many of the things that people describe when they feel like they've seen a ghost are, are very physical things. You know, the hairs standing on your neck, all these things. And they have reasons dating back to those times you know when the hairs stick up on your neck that's to trap heat to keep you warmer you know and and um even shitting yourself actually has a, a function it makes you less attractive to predators you know so, <laughs> so, uh, i mean th these are things that our body has designed so so fear is this integral part of our body and and fear yeah. not so just often... predators are they not just predators it makes you less attractive to other people <laughs> as well and <laughs> potential true. mates. It is true. It's true. You know. To most yeah. of them, some people yeah. like it. Anyone who's ever done that on a date will know that. Um, but um, yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, but no. I mean, you know, so often, you know, you can cite fear as a major factor in a haunting. I think. Yeah. Um, well, look, it's great you found uh, this. I think a very Danny Robbins niche because actually, the first time I saw you, you and Dan Tetzel and uh, some other people were doing a ghost hunter comedy show at the Edinburgh Fringe which is where that's where just just before we started doing that was then this is now that's why yeah uh, so you've you've always been obsessed with this I have, idea yeah. both both for comedy and uh, and and in reality I, I, but I also go on. and I was just gonna say I, I think I think it stems back to childhood I, I I grew up in a household that was entirely atheist and uh, my mum had been a Catholic and, and so when she, and, and then she sort of renounced it at university. And so when we used to go to my grandparents, I would see all these Catholic icons on the walls. And I was fascinated by the idea of belief. And so I've always, I think, wanted to be part of a gang that believed, you know. And, I, and I've, at various points in my life, I've sort of found myself investigating, you know, religious sects and, and ghost believers. And I, I love that. And, but I also think the, the other really seminal experience for me that kind of led me to ghosts, probably, is that when I was in my early 20s, I had this moment where I thought I was going to die. I had this panic attack, um, which, you know, I can now in hindsight see was a panic attack, but at the time never had one before and had no idea what it was. And I, I was convinced I was dying. My heart was pumping out of my chest. I was hallucinating. I could see angels. And I thought in that moment, I thought that was it. And, and it gave me a really strong and profound fear of death for a long time afterwards, like really kind of debilitating and, and controlling in, in a sort of a whole year of my university career. And I think ever since then, I've had this little kind of this fear of death that ticks in my brain and uh, and a kind of a need to kind of somehow try and understand it and explain it. And I, I sort of feel like death is at the heart of all ghost belief. Ghost, ghosts are a way we've created to try and explain death to us. And, you know, in, in the past, that absolutely was a crucial part of the, you know, the, the movement from life to death was this idea that people still existed afterwards. And, and so I feel like as much as ghosts are frightening, I sort of almost feel that they are comforting as well, like that idea of life after death. And I, and I certainly in Haunted, I met some people who were seeing the ghost of their husband in their house and finding it deeply comforting. And, and, and that's, you know, in those moments, the last thing you want to do is say, it's not a real ghost, because that, that was, you know, like, that was like a lifeline to them. It was crucial. Yeah. I should ask, because I do ask many of my guests this, have you ever seen a ghost, Danny? Um, I haven't, and I think no. that that's what keeps me going as well. I think it's that that, that I, I'm living vicariously for all these people because I kind of desperate to see one. Um, no, I, I haven't, and, and um, yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of a source of a bit of disappointment to me, really. I, I've got well, two things: I, I I can't sing, and I would love to be in a band, and I've never seen a ghost. I would love to see a ghost. Those are my two great, <laughs> great the great tragedies of my life. 
Okay, well, let's talk about because we've done a lot of other and, and, and always with even people I know, I'm always amazed. I suppose when you come back to them and see everything they've been up to when you haven't necessarily seen them for a little while, but you've done so much stuff uh, in your writing career beyond all of this in your comedy career. Um, you have uh, had an, a number eleven hit. Do you say you don't want to be in a band? You've got to number eleven in in some charts. I don't know any more than that. Uh, what is the we what's got, the story behind we, that? We got to number eleven in the UK charts in the days the when that counted. Like I think it's like two thousand and three or something. And um, and it was by accident. Um, it's a it's a good story. So Dan Tetzel, who you know all too well, um, I do. Uh, he was walking through a branch of HMV and he heard this song playing and he was like. I recognise that voice. What's that? Is that a sample from something? And he went, hold on a minute. We wrote that. And and this DJ had sampled this sketch that we'd done from a show called Barking on Channel 4, which, no, you won't remember. Um, but but Marcus Brickstock, uh, 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 who worked as part of the, the Club Seal sketch team with us, he would performed this sketch and Dan and I had written it with him. And um, and he, th- this DJ had nicked it. Basically, his friend had put his this sketch on his answer phone and the DJ had sampled the answer phone. So he had no idea where it came from. So then we rocked up and said, actually, sorry, mate, that's our sketch. And and uh, we had to go through this whole kind of legal battle and get agents involved. And we had like people sending us these things where they were kind of tr- trying to claim that every time in the song it went, ooh, ooh, ah, ah, did that count as a, as a lyric? So even though our sample was really the only words in the song, he was trying to try claim we only wrote 50% of it. But, but, uh, but at the end of it, we, we got a few thousand pounds out of it. And he he was on top of the pops performing it because uh, it got to number 11. And uh, and we said, like, can we come on top of the pops with you? And he wouldn't let us. <laughs> he, he's called DJ Decline. And, and it was called uh, I Don't Smoke the Reefer. And it, it was a really massive garage track. It's on lots of garage compilations. And I think it was kind of, it came out again recently, a kind of remix. So, um, you know, so if you hear that, that that's us. And, and uh, DJ Decline, if you're listening, you should have yeah. let us on top of the pops. Yeah, he declined. He really that's did. What, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. He's, got to, he's got to live by his name. He's a DJ who declines. Uh, and you were also, in the music terms, and nearly in a band, you came second in the UK Air Guitar <laughs> Championship. I did. I did. I had a brief phase of doing lots of air guitar, actually. I had, I had this friend who ran... Uh, a club night. He still runs a club night called Club de Fromage and Feeling Gloomy at the um, Islington Academy, which is like one of the kind of last kind of big London clubs that's still going strong. But um, but he he got very into air guitar and he sort of got the franchise for doing the UK air guitar championships, I think. And and but we had a band called Satan's Underpants and we performed and we used to do Beastie Boys Fight for Your Right to Party and I'd wear a big blonde permed wig and uh, it was great. I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> The only second, though, you're disappointed. To, I mean, that's a very rich town. Well, we, we were we were robbed, absolutely robbed. Yeah, um, <laughs> but um, but I think it is me vicariously living out my rock star dreams because I I'm horrifically unmusical, like to the point where when I was a kid, my guitar teacher told my mum to stop sending me because it was a waste of money, um, and and I don't think I've ever quite got over that, and and, and being totally and utterly tone deaf. To the point where, like, you know, I, I can't sing with a group of people because it just puts everybody else off, you know. And, and, you know, do you know when you go to a pantomime and at the end you have to, like, clap along? Yeah. I can't do that. I can't clap in time. So I have to pretend. Maybe you're a ghost. Have you thought of that? That maybe you died when you saw those angels, you died. And the rest of it is you just living your life thinking you're still alive. But, you know, you come second. That's a, a second in the IA Guitar Championships. That would never happen. Um and uh, the, what was the, you did, um, your TV debut was in Let's Make a Baby, which was a fake reality show that you convinced people was, was real. Is that? That's is that, right. I, yeah, so, I, have, I haven't heard about this. No, okay. That's okay. So, that so was, much we haven't talked about yeah, in our that, lives. That notched up a few column inches in its day, but basically they, they set me the challenge. It was, it was again a while back and it was kind of when reality TV was really just kind of kicking off in a big way. And, um, and they set me the challenge of marketing the most offensive uh, reality TV known to humankind and seeing if I could sell it at uh, MIPCOM, the big TV festival in Cannes, and seeing if I could get people involved to take part. And I guess it was to sort of show how extreme reality TV could go. But basically the premise was that it was a, a reality TV show about creating a baby. And and, um, and and then the other day, I mean, this is about maybe a few months ago, people sent me links to a show that is that, that is actually happening now. <laughs> yeah. So this is probably like 
15 years down the line and, and it's happening, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> so was your show that two two people just randomly got together to make the perfect baby? Yeah, essentially. And is that, and is that the actual show? Yeah. yeah, it is. It's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. You should have made the show. But, but you, know, you know what? After doing that, though, I was then offered a reality TV show that was way, way, way more offensive than that. I went into a meeting with a TV company and they asked my agent to come with me, which I should have known was a warning sign because you don't normally have that. Like, why would the agent have to come for like sort of safeguarding kind of thing? So we both went into this room and sat with these two guys and they said to me, Danny, great, loved the show you did. Um, we were wondering how you would feel about catching a sexually transmitted disease for a reality TV show. And I said, uh, not, not great, not, not really that good about that. And then they said, okay, that's fine. That's fine. That's okay. That's cool. Um, how would you feel in, in this case about taking, going out to a nightclub, picking up a girl, bringing her back to your house and having sex with her? And then afterwards, you could tell her you had an STD to see how she reacted. I mean, you, would, you wouldn't have one. You could just tell her that. How would you feel about that? I mean, it was just, I, 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 you know, it's the one, about the one time in my career I've walked out of a meeting. It was just <laughs> jaw-dropping. And thank God it didn't happen. But you know. did, that sh- did the show get made with someone else? No, it didn't. You interested to see who said yes to that. I mean, that That's I, it. I mean it, 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 it's those things that you're offered. I mean, there was an, another one I was offered, which was about pretending to be a pig and living as a pig for a week and eating out of uh, like a trough and stuff like that. Right. And, and that one did happen. I don't know if anyone remembers yes. it, but there was a show where people pretended to be a farmyard animal. Um, but like, you know, I remember being like kind of asked, you know, like I had someone from the BBC calling up and saying, please, please do this. And I was like, no, I'm not going to be a pig. But uh, <laughs> but the STD one, I'm very glad to say didn't happen. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe it'll happen. So maybe after it's been on Rahalastapur, that will be back, yep. that idea. There you go. I'm sure it had a social conscience of, you know, beyond... <laughs> Beyond the picking up a woman in order to, if you if 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 you'd said, yeah, I'm happy to have a sexually transmitted disease, would they have then said, and how would you feel about going and picking up a girl from a club and having sex, with her, and then telling her she's got a sexually transmitted disease? That would that have been? Do you think that's where they were going with it? I I, I mean, I don't know. It's just horrific. I mean, it's frightening to think that maybe there were some people who who said yes to it. I don't know. I, I hope not. I don't, it feels like a Chris Morris thing where Chris Morris would yeah yeah check check how far. Yeah, yeah, some you know, uh, it would be weird for him to pick on some you know an unknown <laughs> new people who are keen to get into TV. But uh, yeah, that's that's. Uh, so what's the what's the weirdest things you've ended up doing? You were mentioning before we came on air that something that wasn't in my notes that you claim to have done on TV, <laughs> which sounds worse than having a sexually transmitted d- d- disease on TV. Is this true that you told me you had masturbated on TV? It, it is true, yeah. And, and, and what, was that, sort of, what was that about? In a way, I'm surprised this doesn't come up more often in conversation. But um, <laughs> after I made that, um, it was for the Mischief Strand on BBC Three, and after I made that one about pitching the reality TV format, they asked me to do this thing about sperm donation. And it was about this big kind of scandal that was going on at the time, which was about um, they were making it so that um, people could discover who their sperm donor was so so that after donating sperm then like sort of 25 years later or whatever somebody could come and track you down and find that you, you know you were their father and um yeah. and it was something that was putting huge amounts of people off donating sperm because they wanted to do it anonymously and um so we started making this show about trying to encourage men to go out and become sperm donors and and i was traveling the country in this um kind of winnebago this one of those uh, what, what do they call it? Airstream Winnebago's, you know, the kind of funky ones with the silver foil kind of on the, on the oh, outside. Yeah. And um, traveling all around, like going up to like Hadrian's Wall and the Lake District and then all over the place. Like, we were on Giant's Causeway at one point outside Belfast and trying to convince men to donate sperm. And, and it, like looking back, it was like really unhygienic and quite grim that men would come in to this Winnebago and donate sperm. They would, they would sort of do it there in the Winnebago, like with me kind of just outside, kind of whistling outside the door. <laughs> Again, it's one of those ones where you go like, why did I let people do it? Let me make me do this. But, um, but yeah, they did incredibly. They kind of filmed me producing a sperm sample. Um, like only from like the shoulders up. I mean, I have to say, like you did not see you know the business but you end. You still had it. to perform. You had to perform yeah. in front of a. Ca- was there a cameraman in the room? No, no, you? no. It was, I think it was a, just filming a, a, yourself. Locked off shot. Yeah. Um, of me getting a sperm sample, and and um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not quite sure how I feel about it now. Whether it was a good thing to do or not. Um, 
But um, so if I want to see your cum face, I can find a piece of footage. I, I think thank, me. thankfully it's not on the internet. I don't know. You'd have to c- <laughs> come to my house and I could show it to you. Uh, yes, hidden I, away on a, a... on a DVD in a box in my in my attic. I think um, it's quite. I mean, it's difficult. To, I mean, that's why you know porn stars are in demand because it's difficult to do those things while you're being watched, unless that's what you particularly enjoy. It's funny, I, I, I've never had a lot of shame about sort of things. Like that. I mean, I, I've been naked on telly a few times. I, 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 I think in that same programme, I was naked with a group of ice hockey players in, in Denmark, uh, I think. But, um, you know, I've, I've, I've done that a few times. I, I don't mind that too much. I kind of, I, I feel like I'm able to kind of disconnect from, you know, me off stage and me on stage with that. But um, I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I still don't know if it was a great thing to do to... <laughs> to give a sperm sample on television, but and did the sperm you know, get then used and to make a child anyway? Well, actually, it's that, almost your idea. But that's an interesting point. Actually, they they were the producers were putting a bit of pressure on me to to actually donate the sperm, and I and I didn't feel comfortable doing that because that was at the point where I was talking about actually having kids with my wife, and I didn't like the idea that you know somebody would come and track me down in twenty five years. Um, <laughs> so. No. And then they say, well, do you want to see the moment that yeah. you were created? <laughs> Here's a minute. Here we go. This is ground zero. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so I, I, I kind of, you know, I think they were a bit disappointed that I didn't actually donate the sperm, but I, I'm glad I didn't do that. Um, <laughs> I think it's very easy when you're young and trying to get ahead um, in, in TV or whatever, it's very easy to get caught up in doing things that you don't necessarily feel comfortable about. And I, I mean, you obviously do see that in reality television with some of the Kind of awful things. Like, I, do you remember a woman called Kinga who was on I, Big I Brother? Do, yeah, very much so. And and you know, she, and th- this thing of her pleasuring herself with a bottle on, on Big Brother. And and you know, I, I met her for my reality TV program, right. uh, about documentary about it, and talked to her and just about how traumatized that was and what a huge impact that had on her life. And and you know, they they can be very damaging those moments. Those things where somebody gets yeah. caught up in the moment and carried away and the TV company are benefiting from it and the person is very definitely suffering from it. No, of course. Well, you know, there's a, uh, yeah, there's uh, it's an exploitative uh, business we work in, which hopefully will become less so, but it's, it, it is interesting to hear that, you know, obviously there's all the me too stuff we've heard about, but there's equally the, that sort of gray area where, where people are, you know, desperate for work and desperate to get that, that leg up on the ladder. And then you end up doing some, yeah, doing some things that, and especially when you presented with it in the moment, I did. It was not in any way the same, really. But I did a show called Best Man Speech, which was uh, presented to me as like, "Oh, you're going to meet a guy who's going to get married uh, and his best man, and you're going to help the guy write his speech." But then it was, you know, I thought, "Oh, this, yeah, that'd be interesting." And then it was hardly any of it was that, and it was just a load of putting him through a load of stupid stunts, like he'd broken his arms and had to help someone help him. Uh, make a phone call you know you had to persuade someone to make a phone call you go well, this isn't anything to do with i mean the thing this is, is ju- this yeah. is just you want to simulate a guy but you once you've signed on the line you're sort of in luckily absolutely nobody saw that show it went out on itv4 or something like that and uh this, and this I, is the thing you do not have control you know you do sign your life away and i, I remember working with a producer years back who'd always talk about oh just do that and I'll, I'll have an option in the edit an option in the edit you know and you knew that as soon as you did the thing that he wanted you to do that you didn't want to do that was the one that was going to be on screen you know yeah um, yeah I don't know I mean it's hard I mean it, it, a lot of it comes down to kind of um having an integrity doesn't it like I, I sort of feel like you know when I'm editing interviews of people you know I, I I you could easily go one way and make them sound like they're saying something else but you have to have an integrity to not only to to sort of the moment, but I mean, you know, maybe they did say things that they sort of perhaps, you know, didn't phrase that well, was a bit clumsy or they, they, they maybe shouldn't have said. And you feel like, you know, do you want to put that out there? You know, do you want to sort of like, you know, make them look bad, you know, and you, you kind of feel like you don't, you know, so you don't include that. I know. Well, not, you know, that's that's how we work on this show as well. Uh, obviously, when it's live, you, you're, you're stuffed, but, um, you know, on the we, we absolutely let people take stuff out and often have taken things out. And in one case, not put out a show because I felt the okay. guest came across so badly yeah. that it wouldn't have been fair to him. Um, but anyway, let's move on to you have worked with Basil Brush, and that is I'm very interested in puppets. Yeah, that's what I'm most interested in. Um, uh, I, I so did like tell so, me about. Well, so Dan Tetzel and I, we kind of effectively relaunched Basil Brush in in like the early 2000s, I think it was, and um, uh, you know he'd been out of fashion for a long time. His glory days were long behind him, and then. Uh, this company had bought the rights and they wanted to relaunch him. And, and we wrote the pilot episode and we wrote quite a few episodes after that as well. So we sort of 
kind of effectively kind of had a big say in what he was going to be like. And and they were desperate for him to be this kind of youth icon and to not say like, you know, boom, boom. And, you know, I say, I say, hello, Mr. Roy. Um, and uh, we sort of fought really hard to keep all that and to keep him yes. like that. But um, yeah, my, my kids have become obsessed with Basil Brush because we've got this this book about him on our shelf and they keep pulling it out and making me do jokes in a Basil Brush voice, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Here's the 21st century Basil Brush. But there he is. Look at that. That's Law Fox. That's very good. Is it? Yeah, Fox Law with Law Fox. He may be based on someone with a similar name. <laughs> Hello, it's me, Law Fox. <laughs> and he tries, and I try to get him to say boom, boom. But the thing with Basil Brush is he wasn't a ventriloquist act. This boom, boom would be a very bad catchphrase for it. Doom, doom. You know, it doesn't work. So it sounds like doom, doom. There you go. Uh, that's uh, another I, I, one of my puppets. I, I, I did weirdly find myself doing all of Basil's interviews for a while. I'd be doing like these web chats for The Guardian, being Basil and us, oh, really? answering people's questions, you know. And, um, yeah, I mean, I love Basil as a character. And I, I, I mean, I loved him as a, I loved him so much as a kid. I don't know because you're a bit younger than me. I don't know whether it would be such a big deal. But he was like when I was growing up, it was absolutely a miss. And Roy North, there was my Mister Roy was my was my uh, was the the guy that I remember being with him. But uh, I just absolutely loved him as a kid. He's, I think he was in the, I think he was one of the one of the puppets was in the in the that Covent Garden Museum of Childhood or Toy Museum there, and it was actually kind of. Seeing, I think it was there I saw him, but seeing Basil Brush in real life was actually quite a weird moment for me because it meant so much to me as a kid. So actually working with him and writing for him is uh, insane. Uh, was it the same guy? Was it the same guy doing the? Because he gave up, didn't he? I, I, by that I, stage, I, I, Ivan Owen. I think he'd passed away yeah. by that stage. But Eddie, the, yeah. the man who was doing it then kind of had ginger hair and a sort of slightly fox-like quality to him. Uh, but he, he, I mean, I think he was someone who'd worked on cruise ships and was a kind of. You know, entertainer, and then suddenly landed this gig. But, but th there's a great story about Ivan Owen, the, the original Basil Brush, negotiating Basil's contract with the BBC. And apparently, he used to drive up in a Rolls Royce, wind the window down, and Basil would stick out the window, and he'd sign the contract with Basil. And I, I don't know if that's true or not, but if it is, then it's it's absolutely brilliant that they made yeah. BBC executives come and stand outside Broadcasting House and hold a contract to the window of the car as a fox signed. See, it's not. He was under the table. That's not. You can't. He didn't even sit next to him and do it. Oh, don't be a skeptic, what, Rich. What kind, <laughs> what kind of allow the magic kind of to persist? It was a real fox. <laughs> I want the I want the magic of ventriloquism <laughs> to persist. Not just going. Oh, I'll just hide under the table and do his voice. Apps. All puppeteers and ventriloquists are perverts and offenders. <laughs> I think that's my theory. Apart from Nina. Apart Conti, from Nina Conti, I'm definitely. Even, yeah. I'm not even sure about that. And <laughs> me. Um, of course, they used to do ventriloquism on the radio, didn't they? Back in yeah, the well, that's, I, my ventriloquism does go out as a podcast. You can enjoy it as a podcast <laughs> if you want. There is a filled version, but you can. People do. I don't know how many download the. It's quite confusing because most of my puppets sound quite similar, so it's better to have. It's better to watch it with the puppets. I, I, I wrote it, but then you don't. <laughs> you don't see how bad the ventriloquism is if you if you don't watch it. So you know, it's there's a, it's a double edged sword. It's a double edged sword. <laughs> Um, I, 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 wrote, I wrote a joke about a ventriloquist uh, for my play End of the Pier that Les Dennis. I was going to just about mention that. Yeah, was, Les, Les del had to deliver it, but it was one of my favorite jokes that he did really nicely every night. But it was um, about he was playing this old school comedian called Bobby Chalk, and, and he was like, uh, I had a fight with a ventri ventriloquist once. He was giving it all that, <laughs> which <laughs> only works on video. But for those listening in audio, I'm now holding my hand up and making it. <laughs> yes. A little chatting symbol. <laughs> don't um, don't help them. Don't help the audio <laughs> idiots. Um, how did that play go? That was so. That was a. That was a. Uh, the idea of a kind of a, a, an old school comedian and was his son a, a, an alternative comedian? Was that the idea? Yeah, yeah, comedian? yeah. So I mean, Les played a, an, a, an old school comic of the kind of you know Cannonball, Little and Large era, who'd had twenty million viewers on a Saturday night. That kind of level of fame. And then to sort of become a pariah after uh, after um, making a racist joke, essentially. And and um, and then he um, had a son uh, played by Blake Harrison, who came along, who was kind of very much a sort of Michael McIntyre kind of you know big new TV comic, you know. And at first, you think that he's you know the opposite, the polar opposite, and incredibly kind of left wing. And then what emerges during the play is that you know he's been involved in this incident, which is actually a race, racial assault on a, on a guy, and that he actually has all this kind of simmering hatred and it's kind of about about tracing back the roots of how he feels to to his you know to what happened with his father and and it's kind of um 
it's exploring, I guess, the kind of the power of comedy to not, you know, comedy can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing. It can be something that can be bullying and, and victimizing. And that line that comedy needs victims, you know, and, and I guess it t- taps into that thing that we sometimes talk about in comedy that I think it's probably kind of like a, a term that comedians use. I don't know if people know it so much outside, but about punching up and punching down. You know that if you're punching up, you're you're. It's a justified target. It's you know satirical. You're attacking the government or whatever. And punching down is you know like picking on people. You know like picking on refugees yeah. or whatever. And and um and so it was about that kind of idea. And and at the end, you have the person that uh, Michael, the younger comedian, attacked, comes back into the picture. And actually, uh, he's played by Nitin Ganatra brilliantly on stage. And and he performs his own stand-up routine. He sort of hijacks Michael's TV show and performs his own stand-up routine, which is way funnier than Michael's and, and, and very powerful and kind of deals with issues of race from, from the perspective of being this Bangladeshi guy who, who's moved to the UK and, uh, you know, an immigrant to the UK. So, I mean, yeah, it, it was, it was amazing. And, 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 you know, Les clearly comes from that time when there were a lot of racial jokes told, but, but Les is very much not that at all. Les is this, I mean, I've never met a nicer man than Les, quite frankly, it's, You'd probably testify yourself, but but you know it was really interesting to have him play that, and he did it very powerfully. Yeah, well, there were a great cast, and you do do a lot. I mean, we have, we're we're running out of time, so I'll just quickly mention. But you do you have written a lot of uh, Radio Four stuff as well. You've done the uh, the Cold Swedish Winter, which was based on your own experience, I presume. Of uh, we did mention it briefly earlier uh, of of marrying a Swedish <laughs> I, lady. I did. I mar- married a Swede, and and then kind of uh, that's. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, Sweden's become a massive part of my life now, really. I've, I've right. made, I think we're now, you know, we've just made the fifth series of The Cold Swedish Winter and right. and I've made various documentaries about Sweden as well. And I find myself endlessly fascinated. It, it's this idea of a country that is similar to ours, but at the same time, kind of crucially different and, and sort of exotically different in a way. And I think things work better in Sweden. Like the, there's, there's an, an old line actually of Lou Reed from a, a film where he says, I don't trust Sweden, man. Everything works there. And it's it's kind of, <laughs> kind of true. Like Sweden is this brilliantly, brutally efficient country. And um, and my wife's biggest insult for anyone is, it's so inefficient. You know, like when I'm doing the washing up or doing something wrong in the house, why do you have to be so inefficient? And, and the Swedes have got it cracked. So a lot, a lot of the cold Swedish winter is about trying to kind of understand how the Swedes have their society so cracked. And that, that kind of um, that battle between British inefficiency and, and Swedish efficiency. It is the, the Scandinavia is interesting, and I don't I haven't been there very much, but I've been out a little bit with uh, when when talking clock kind of travelled the world. I don't, I don't think it, I don't think I went to Sweden, or did I go to Sweden? God, I don't even remember now. Uh, and what I found sort of fascinating about one of the maybe it was Sweden was one of the one of the Scandinavian countries. You, it, you sort of it get because it's sort of slightly removed from the rest of you. You know, in with France and Germany and Italy, you sort of feel oh, I know a little bit about how that how things work there but but scandinavia seems you know we're not we're not quite as au fait with how it works and when i went to this premiere in one of the scandinavian countries i forget which one um it had all the big it had quite a big name guy doing it and all the big stars in sweden came to or wherever came to watch it and obviously as an outsider you just see all these people who are nobody at <laughs> all to you. You've never encountered them in any way. And they're all being, people are going, oh, and you, it sort of gives you a real insight into the nature of, I just remember this really old guy who was basically the Cliff Richard of of wherever this country was. And he was he had a very young girlfriend and he was just, but he just looked like an old man wearing moccasins. And you just get, you know, you you it would be inexplicable why he was with this. I think you do you do find that in in Scandinavian countries, I think in Germany as well, I found this that that famous people are more humble, like you know, pop, right. pop stars and film stars. They're much more approachable, and they don't have the big ego because in those countries, and in particularly in Scandinavian countries, like that's really frowned upon to be arrogant. There's right. there's this whole thing in Scandinavia called Jantelagen, the law of Jante, and it's basically. Uh, it stems back from a novel written in the 30s, but it's this kind of set of laws of don't be, you know, you know that line, don't be a tall poppy. Tall poppies are cut down, you know, like don't, basically don't try and stand out from the crowd. So each rule is like, you know, don't think you're better than anybody else. Don't try and, you know, be clever than anybody else. And, it, and it's all about kind of being modest, being mediocre, if you like. And and, and so that's kind of really intrinsic in, in Scandi society. And, uh, you know, <laughs> I've talked to like Swedish rappers, you know, and, and Swedish rappers are like the opposite of bling. You know, <laughs> they drive a Volvo and they um, 
they're just not talking about kind of you know who's got the most guns and who's got the most uh, jewelry you know it's it's all about like you know having a sensible house and a nice lifestyle <laughs> uh, it is very different i think yeah Oh, well, I'm glad you could do so many of those. So five series of that. Rudy's Rare Records you did with uh, Lenny Henry yeah, yeah. as well. Uh, so, you, it's, you know, you, you're fitting a lot in. <laughs> you're doing very well. You've masturbated on TV. <laughs> <laughs> that'll, take, that'll take over. You've interviewed Morrissey. Haven't even talked about that. Th- that was and a you, separate and, occasion, by the way. <laughs> you, uh, but um, no, that, that, I mean, oh, dear. What's happened to Morrissey? I, 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 I mean... When did you when did you yeah, interview him? I, I interviewed him before he became okay. the the indie Nigel Farage. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I interviewed him, but even then he was very prickly. I, I went up to Newcastle and interviewed him just before he did a gig up there, and it was for the Culture Show, and they were doing this thing about the greatest living icons, and and, and he was like number three, I think he was in the top three, and so I was sent up there to interview him, and and um, and he was so prickly, like you know, he was up against David Attenborough. And he chose this opportunity not to go, great, thanks for the prize. You know, he chose it to take a pop at David Attenborough. And he was like sort of saying, I don't like David Attenborough. And I was like, why? And he went, <laughs> he went, because he calls animals wild animals. They should call them free animals. They're free. They're not wild. And I was like, Morrissey, you know, please choose your hill to die on. You know, that, um, and then I got talking to him about, um, <laughs> you, you know, that song that he did called Irish Blood, English Heart, I think it's called. Oh, yeah. It's quite a good song, you know, Irish yeah. blood, English heart, I am made of. And um, there's a line in it about the Queen saluting Oliver Cromwell. And I'm like, where did that come from? That's a really weird line to put into a pop song full stop, but also didn't really make any sense to me. And and he said that the reason was to do with the Queen having a portrait of Oliver Cromwell somewhere in one of her palaces or like in Parliament. I can't even remember what it was now, but... And, and and it really bothered him, you know, because obviously Cromwell was involved in terrible things to Irish people. But yeah. but the fact that the Queen had a picture of him somewhere was kind of really made him really angry. So he, he struck me as somebody who kind of finds little things to get very, very angry about. And sort of, you know, he, he, he's, you know, he, he kind of has real bugbears. And, and um, <laughs> he just struck me as someone who's very annoyed all the time, essentially. <laughs> he was quite a miserable man. And I've heard yeah. stories subsequently, like I did a gig in some gigs in Greece and I was told that the crew that he travels around with are all really miserable and that he's, you know, he's a passionate uh, vegetarian, isn't he? And he, he's banned anybody from his tour from eating meat. He won't let them eat meat. And so apparently all of these guys from his crew were going out and secretly eating meat, uh, <laughs> hiding from him and trying not to get caught. And, and I think you get sacked if you ate meat. But anyway, I don't know. I mean, it was at one level, it was amazing to meet him. Uh, but now sort of when I sort of hear and see some of the things that he said subsequently, I sort of feel I could see I could see the roots of a man who was angry and quite bitter about the world. Yeah, so, well, that's sort of interesting to get maybe get it that way around. But you know, I'd, but I you see that a lot with. That's my my fear is I see a lot of middle aged <laughs> white men who you know are, are losing their power and losing their influence and then become horrible, twisted kids. And then you kind of go, oh, what if that? What if that? <laughs> will I just wake up one day and that will be me, or or, does, or will I be okay? Is the fact I'm aware of it mean I'm going to be okay? You know, or it's it, it, and I suppose it's because partly because you've social media, you would never have known your friends were turning slightly Brexity or racist or or just you know, it's it's very, I mean, the world's so weird at the moment. The kind of things that people get a- angry about, but it, it really changes your view of someone yeah. when you see them. No, it's really interesting, and, and that's part part of what I kind of became obsessed with when I was writing the play that Les was in, End of the Pier, that about that that moment where somebody says or does something that totally irrevocably changes everything. You know, the moment where somebody says the thing in public they should never ever say and, and their career is over and it's and, it, and it's that the way that we view that person before and after you know like it, it, for instance if you look at pictures of Rolf Harris now you've got a picture of Rolf Harris from the 70s and you see like evil Rolf Harris now but back in the day you you wouldn't have seen that but there's something it's like a sort of magic eye picture that you know you, you look at it now and you just see it in a totally different way you see kind of the evil that, you know, you go, oh, the evil was there back in the 70s. We could, you know, now we can see it. But at the time you didn't. But yeah. there's something, there's a kind of transformation that people go through that, um, uh, that, that you know, that, that, that moment in the play, we called it uh, cuntification, uh, <laughs> where <laughs> that moment where suddenly you go, oh, yeah, this person is horrible and evil, you know, but you didn't see it before. And it's the same photograph you're looking at. It's interesting. Law Fox, it's all, it's all there. Uh, look. Uh, Danny, it's been so lovely to catch up with you. I can't believe uh, 
It's it feels like yesterday we were doing the, <laughs> show. the last uh, last decade or so has gone much too fast. Uh, I would like to heartily recommend uh, that people listen, even though they should be listening to my podcast. <laughs> I'm going to let them <laughs> listen to both I simultaneously. Listen, I, I listened to Haunted the entire series in. I started listening to it uh, yesterday afternoon and and finished it like at lunchtime today. So I've pretty much done nothing but listen to Haunted. Uh, and it was just gripping. And I don't usually go that far. I don't go that deep unless I'm enjoying it. And the Battersea Poltergeist is also um, absolutely fantastic and shaping up to be a very... Uh, I can't wait to find out what happens next. And I am going to listen to that one every week uh, as you've hooked me mm-hmm. in. So I recommend those to everyone. Uh, anything else coming up you want to plug or is 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 that your focus at the moment? I mean, I, I think we're doing another series of Cold Swedish Winter later in the year. Um, but, uh, I mean, at the moment, life is very dominated by Battersea Poltergeist, the show. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I, I mean, I, I was going to have, I, I had was due to have a play on in the West End, which would have been brilliant, but COVID has completely destroyed that. So I had this a little sort of fledgling attempt to be playwriting. And, and uh, I've got a couple that were really close to going on, but... You know, uh, waiting now to see if theatre exists as an institution uh, post COVID. <laughs> I think we'll be back, and I hope that will. Be, I hope theatre will be back. I'm at the Clapham Grand on Saturday. That's a theatre. Hopefully, there won't be any people there. But you know, that's not the point, is it? Um, so yes, yeah, so, well, terrific. Well, good luck with everything. Uh, I'm so glad it's going so brilliant for you, ladies and gentlemen. The amazing Danny Robbins. Mm-hmm. Come and see us at the, online at the uh, Clapham Grand. I don't know who's going to be next week on Twitch because I haven't booked anyone yet. <laughs> Thank you very much. Goodbye. See you. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>